everybody uses electricity. It's sort of necessary to the way we live, for better or for worse. Our demand is growing. The days of just putting up a coal plant anywhere are done. What we're really talking about is how do we grow ourselves out of this predicament that we're in right now. Emerging Science is a Vermont Public Television production in partnership with and funded by Vermont NSF EPSCOR. EPSCOR, supporting science and engineering in Vermont colleges and businesses and encouraging young Vermonters to seek careers in science. Hi, I'm Amy Seidel and welcome to Emerging Science. This week we're exploring energy. Basic textbooks describe energy as the ability to do work usually by performing some mechanical, physical, chemical, or electrical task. There is, of course, a long history between energy and human culture, beginning with the water wheel in Roman times, followed by the development of wind power in the 12th century, and continuing through the Industrial Revolution with the development of the steam engine. To narrow our scope, we're going to focus on electrical systems in the U.S., what is commonly known as our power grid. Let's start with some basics. Just how does electricity work? How is it transferred from sites of generation to sites of use? And how has it become so entwined in our lives? In 1831, Michael Faraday made the fundamental discovery that an electric current could be induced when a magnet was moved inside a coil of wire. In essence, the magnet is simply moving the existing electrons in the wire coil. This discovery of electromagnetic induction led to Faraday's invention of the dynamo. The dynamo turns electric current into spin, and a quick review of how it functions explains how spin, in turn, can be transformed into electric current. Electric currents and magnetic fields are so entwined that you can't have one without the other. When you hold your right hand with your fingers curled and your thumb extended, the right hand rule tells us the relative direction of a magnetic field and its corresponding electric current. Electric current is applied to the dynamo and split into two different currents. In this case, our curled fingers represent the electric coil, thus creating a magnetic field down and around the iron base. The other current connects to this terminal and creates a perpendicular magnetic field. When perpendicular magnets are placed in close proximity, they will adjust so that opposite poles line up. The trick of the dynamo is that the commutator breaks the current over and over and continues to create a series of magnetic fields. As the magnetic tendency causes the rotator to spin just a bit, a new magnetic field is created and the process is repeated. The opposite can be applied to turn spin into electric current. Water, wind, or steam is used to spin a generator, creating electricity. One of the first electricity projects uh, historically was Edison's Pearl Street Station. So Edison decided that he wanted to provide electric light in New York City, so he set up a generator and it generated uh, DC electricity that was run through wires through uh, a neighborhood of New York City on Pearl Street. They had a very simple incandescent electric light. That was the sort of the first electric generating system. DC electricity is hard to change the voltage and so because of that you can't really move it over long distances because um, you need high voltages to move power over long distances. And Nikolai Tesla came up with this idea of motors that ran on AC electricity so uh, instead of a direct current where the current is constant over time the current alternates kind of up and down up and down. They uh, came up with the idea of generating electricity from Niagara Falls using the, that energy from the waterfall and sending it to uh, industrial facilities in Buffalo, New York, about 20 miles away. Eventually that same line was extended down to Pittsburgh and the uh, aluminum and steel mills were powered by these transmission lines. And so it really was this invention of electricity that you know, sort of propelled the American economy during those early years. 
The switch was thrown on Tesla's Niagara Falls project on November 16, 1896. In just over a hundred years, the U.S. electric grid has expanded to cover all corners of the continental U.S. The United States electricity infrastructure is actually separated into three pieces, sort of Western North America, Eastern North America, and Texas. Texas is an independent grid. Simply put, how an electric system works is you have generators of electricity, and then you have what's called transmission infrastructure, which carries uh, that generation on, on sort of what I would call super highways of electricity. And then you have what's called substations, which drop it down to then the very small streets um, and neighborhoods. There are thousands of power plants in the eastern United States. I mean, I think something on the order of 5,000. The electrical capacity in the U.S. is immense at 4 million megawatts, of which Vermont uses less than 1% of this capacity, just 1,100 megawatts. Nationally, 49% of our electricity is derived from coal, the world's most abundant fossil fuel that unfortunately is also its most polluting. In addition to coal, 20% of our nation's electricity comes from natural gas. Another 20% comes from nuclear, a technology that Vermont relies heavily on. The primary sources of energy that we power our state with are through contractual arrangements with Vermont Yankee, Hydro-Quebec, and then we own a number of small hydro-generating stations. We all have in there as well the McNeil plant in Burlington, which is a wood-burning facility. We take wood and we burn it in a furnace. And we take that heat and we evaporate water into steam. The steam then goes through a pipe to the turbine generator. And the turbine generator, uh, it's 36 stages of rotating blades. And as the steam is coming through these blades, it's causing the blades to rotate at 3,600 revolutions per minute. So at that point, you're converting the thermal energy into mechanical energy. Then we have a shaft that transmits the, the mechanical energy to the generator. All electricity is is moving electrons, and what we're doing is we're taking a magnet that's moving inside the generator and causing those electrons to move. To put it in perspective, if we're producing 50 megawatts, that's the same as 50,000 kilowatts. A typical house is somewhere in the neighborhood of a kilowatt consumption average use. Another way of looking at it is that 50 megawatts is about the average load for the city of Burlington, Vermont. There's not a lot of generation in Vermont. We're at 50 megawatts, we're the second largest generator in the state. And the largest one is Vermont Yankee, which is about 600 megawatts. I think it's reasonable to assume we could make uh, between 150 and 200 megawatts of power from biomass in Vermont. So I kind of look at that to say you could probably put probably another two or three McNeil stations in Vermont. Obviously, burning wood to generate electricity has its benefits, yet plants like McNeil meet only a small percentage of our state's power demand. For 35 years, Vermont utilities have been buying nuclear power to supply a majority of the state's demand. Vermont Yankee in Vernon supplies over a third of Vermont's electricity needs. Nuclear energy, similar to coal, produces intense heat that creates steam to turn a turbine and generate power. While the basic principles of electricity generation are the same between coal and nuclear, there are a multitude of factors that differ. These include the finite supply of uranium, the danger in disposing and storing radioactive waste, and how to decommission nuclear facilities. Nuclear reactors work by the fissioning of uranium-235 atoms. When it's struck by a, a neutron, it becomes unstable and falls apart into two elements, such as uh, krypton and barium, and releases uh, extra neutrons. The neutrons, in turn, may encounter another uranium-235 atom and cause it to fission and start a chain reaction. That causes heat to be released, which then causes, eventually, water to change the steam to run a turbine to run a generator. The costs for that fuel, by the way, are mostly due to the high cost of the enrichment process. Uranium is composed principally of two isotopes, U-238 and 235. 238 is very plentiful. 99.3% of all uranium is that isotope. But that one does, is not fissile. It will not split apart when hit by a neutron. It's the U-235 that is fissile and releases the energy when it breaks apart into two other 
atoms. But that's only 0.7% of the uranium. And so in the United States, at least, we need to have that fuel enriched. The Manhattan Project was all about technologies to enrich that uranium by passing it all through membranes. And the 238, which is just ever so slightly bigger than, or heavier than the 235, could be selectively extracted by multiple passes through multiple membranes. In the worst accident we've had, it was a tragic accident we had in Chernobyl. Something like 130 people died directly from radiation uh, from that accident. And a somewhat unknown number of a few thousand people may contract cancer from that uh, radiation, but we'll never know who those people are. That was an outgrowth of a plant that was designed to produce nuclear weapons, plutonium. I had no containment structure whatsoever, would never have been licensed in any of the Western world. The public is pretty much reassured that that can't happen in the U.S. because of the designs of the plants that were here. People seem to be reassured about the safety of the plants, it's, but they are concerned about what to do with the waste. And that is a, a difficult problem to deal with. Spent fuel that comes out of a power plant has many radioactive components. Some of the atoms decay very quickly, and because of that, they emanate a lot of radiation and are sort of hazardous to handle. Others of the atoms have a long lifetime and don't emit very much radiation in reality. When you hear someone talking about the waste products from spent fuel being, you know, hazardous for millions of years, uh, you have to think about that because if it decays quickly, it creates a lot of radiation and it's hazardous, but it doesn't last long. If it lasts millions of years, it's not decaying very quickly and it's not so hazardous. So what the power plants do is to put that spent fuel in a water tank and for a period of a few years until the elements that have a shorter half-life of months or years mostly uh, decay away. The longer live radiation products then are not so dangerous and so what they do is they pull the fuel rods out and they put them in dry storage right now on the site of the power plant and that is the current strategy in the United States today. All the spent fuel is stored right at the power plant itself. The potential is that a little capsule, perhaps a centimeter by a half a centimeter, has in it the potential energy of perhaps three barrels of oil imported from the Mideast. The realities are, of course, you want a diversified whole portfolio of energy sources. All these things have a role to play. There hasn't been a nuclear power facility built in the United States in over 30 years. Some states, however, are considering licensing new nuclear plants in an attempt to generate electricity with lower carbon emissions. Many see nuclear as a low carbon alternative. Others are concerned that its high cost and radioactive waste make it a poor choice.